months, you know, two years of digital transformation in two months, you know, the, and, and it's and it's continued at this pace. Um, a recent study from McKinsey said we've had five years of transformation, i.e. The, the application of technology um, since the beginning of the COVID crisis in um, mid-March. Uh, so we, you know, what we might thought of about was possible in two to three years time, the analysis was te would tell us that it could be and should be possible now. So those dreams that we had about as technology people, and I'm assuming people on this call are fans of using tech, the dream of doing more with more teachers, with more students, maybe that dream is closer. And maybe we should challenge ourselves to support our colleagues to move this forward um, to, the, to the world that, that, that we see and that we all operate in. Um, I think that's the end of my, of, of my bit. So please, in the words of Mother Teresa of Calcutta, she used to talk to her, to her nuns, her co-workers, as she called them. She said, dream big, act small. There's a big dream for, for us. Let's, let's impact as many people from this session as we can. Let's challenge them to think big. Now, what Rachel's going to do is to focus in on some of the very pragmatic technology that she's working with uh, teachers every day to support uh, this blended learning in the classroom. So, Rachel, I think I'm over to you now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, James. And like James said, um, thanks everyone so much for joining. And it's 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 really exciting to have you here because what an amazing time to be in ed tech um, with all the advancements that have been made and all the mindsets that have been changing about how we use technology in the classroom. And um, the fact that you're here and it's maybe your last, your second last week of, of school um, is quite a commitment. So, so thank you very much. Uh, what I'm going to be running through is um, how we can engage our students online and that can be both in person when we're using technology and devices with our students in class, but it can also be uh, if there does become a need again to be uh, teaching remotely, or even if we do come to a stage, which I tend to feel might be likely, where we have majority of our students back, but then some students who will not be physically in the class with us. So how can we continue to support them online in a really engaging way? We'll also take a look at providing clear expectations because just like you do in a classroom as a teacher with your behavioral expectations, with your, um, you know, the structure that you've set for the day and the routine, all those things you expect your students to know. When we're moving into an online environment, sometimes we do need to adapt a little bit and um, just make sure that the students are aware of all of the things we expect so that we can have a really nicely organized and effective teaching and learning experience. And then finally, we'll have a quick look at how we can get started in September using technology. And I've got some tips for how we can use it in class and also remotely as well. And um, those are especially around getting to know your students, um, which will be super important come September. So you may have seen that I've added a Jamboard link for you in the chat. I've seen that someone's already joined there. Um, the link here, uh, if you want to put it into your URL bar, is bit.ly slash HP and Joscos. So if you want to join in there, um, I've also put it in the chat so you can click it straight from there. Um, I'm going to be jumping over now to our Jamboard. Thank you, those people who have shared. Um, right. So if you haven't used Jamboard before, it's an awesome tool that enables you as a teacher to be able to um, use this sort of like, I use it on my interactive whiteboard just to, to draw and do demonstrations, uh, but it's also got amazing collaboration opportunities. So it's great to use with the students um, for them to be able to brainstorm together, uh, working groups together. And I find it's a great tool as well for younger students uh, because as some of you have worked out, you may not have used it before, but it's pretty intuitive. Um, on the, the left-hand side there is where you can um, add in um, your drawings. So if you want to try out the pen, uh, feel free to. Uh, we've got the eraser. Um, you can move your images around using that select icon. Uh, we've also got the sticky note. Um, so if you want to describe what you might be doing this summer or um, come a few weeks, you can use the sticky note in there. Or you can even um, add in some images. And the thing I really like about um, Jamboard is that it uses Google search. So there's a lot of great images that you can add in. I, I was thinking about eating chocolate this morning. So <laughs> I'm going to pop that one in there. Um, but feel free to, to give that a go and to add in some um, pictures that you'd like. There's also an app version of this, which um, I 
like even more that it is an Android app. So it depends on the device that you're using. That might be a question that could come up perhaps for um, our HP representative, Alex, um, around which um, devices Jamboard works well on. So thanks everyone for adding in there. Uh, during the session, there'll also be um, an opportunity for us to go through and have a little bit of a brainstorm on some of the other pages. Um, so if I just show you to move across to the different Jamboards, you can just click this across arrow. So later on, we'll be um, doing a little brainstorm here. And then at any point during the session, if you do want to add in a question um, about any of the HP devices or um, any questions that you have around devices um, and the tools that I'm demonstrating, then um, we've got Alex on hand who's going to be manning uh, this area and um, he will be able to answer your questions and yeah. uh, they also bring those up at the end. Sorry, that's did you want to jump yeah, yeah, no, that's great. So, so uh, yes, guys, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a PC specialist at HP. Um, so, yeah, you know, I'll leave it up to the experts to talk you through, um, you know, the whole learning and blended learning today. Um, but, of course, you know, it's not a one-stop shop for, for devices in your classrooms. Um, so more than happy to, to answer any questions that you have uh, around about the hardware uh, and it'll all tie together with the session. Okay. Amazing. Thank you, Alex. Um, and also, if you've got any questions around um, blended teaching, blended learning, or maybe any concerns that you've got, feel free to pop them in there. And uh, James and I will do our best to answer those as well. Um, or we might come back to them at another, in a part two session or something. Okay, so Jamboard is looking great. Um, I'm going to head back to the slides now, but feel free to, um, to keep entering in there. Okay, so the first things I'm going to be talking about um, is how we can engage our students. And there's three different sort of places that we can do this. So asynchronous, if you're not really familiar with the term, it's a bit of a buzz term that's come up uh, recently. Asynchronous learning is when we are um, teaching our students and they're learning, but it's not happening in the same time and place. So for example, if we're setting our students an assignment or a, a task in Google Classroom or Microsoft Teams, and then they complete it, um, at a time that works for them, that's asynchronous learning. Now, the difference between asynchronous and synchronous is that when we're teaching synchronously, it's happening in the same space and in the same time. Um, so, for example, when we're, well, what, what we're doing right now, <laughs> that's a good example, but also if we're using Microsoft Teams in virtual meetings, um, video calls, Zoom, all those sorts of things, that's uh, where the, the teaching and learning is happening in that same time and space. And um, I guess that's also what we do in class when we're teaching our students um, and when we're using technology too. And then the other um, sort of mode I've brought up as well is building community. Because I think come September, that is gonna be a, such an important thing for our students. Um, our students who many of them won't have been having that sort of constant interaction with their peers. Um, they may not have felt so connected with their teacher. Um, so how can we really support our, our um, students feel connected and, and feel that they, that sense of belonging to school and to their peers? So we'll start off with engaging asynchronous learning. Now, asynchronous learning is how I suggest teachers start off if they're not familiar with, or if they're not sort of used to teaching using technology. It's quite a, um, it's, it can be a bit of a daunting thing to jump straight into synchronous. So to jump straight into a video call where you're teaching your students, that's um, not natural for everyone. So if you start by doing asynchronous learning where you're assigning them tasks, where you're providing them feedback, all those sorts of things um, is a great place to start. And I would suggest you start by um, embedding a learning platform. And I think maybe 100% of you here do already have one set up. Um, and if not, then Just Costs are able to help you. And there's actually government funding to set up Microsoft Teams or Google Classroom. So please reach out if that would be something you'd be interested in. But then next is making sure that the students actually get onto the online learning platform every single day. And so how can we do that? How can we entice our students to want to join that learning platform um, whether they're in school or whether they're at home. Just in the same way that as educators, we want all of our students to want to come to school and to love school and to for the classroom to be an engaging place where they want to come and learn. Uh, so first up, I would suggest making your online platform visually appealing. Um, so these are a couple, this shark one I got from um, a colleague of mine, Emma Pass, who is um, teaching in a hybrid school. So she suggests always um, changing up your uh, banner in Google Classroom. Um, so you can change it up all the time, make it a fun thing for the students to see. But 
But in Microsoft Teams, we've also got awesome options to add in things like GIFs and um, images and emojis and all those sorts of things. So keep it a fun place. Then I'd also say add in exciting stimulus every day. So think about having a question of the day, maybe a theme of the week, um, adding videos, having challenges, having debates of the day. Um, I know for my students, we've got a question of the day that we put in and every morning at 8 a.m. the students know it's going to come up. So they're on there on Google Classroom ready to, um, to, to work out the riddle or to, to share um, their opinion on the question. Uh, we also need to think about um, enabling students to communicate uh, online. Now, this one can be, it's a little bit of a um, contentious subject. So not, I know a lot of schools have been worried about enabling the students to be able to communicate in Google Classroom or Microsoft Teams. Um, just because it's different, it's something that we haven't, you know, not every school's done that before. Um, now, it, I would say from my personal experience, it does need to be monitored and it does need to be done with clear expectations and boundaries. However, the benefits of enabling your students to communicate online uh, is are so great. And um, I highly recommend you um, teach your students how to do that and then enable them too, because it means that they've got an outlet where they're able to communicate. Just like when we're in class, we want our students to be able to talk to each other to discuss their learning. By enabling them to do that online, they can really improve their understanding of the concept and um, be able to, to talk through their ideas. So I would suggest enabling that feature. Uh, next up for asynchronous learning is just being consistent with when the work is being posted so that the students don't turn up um, in their team or in their classroom and wonder where the work is and then leave. So we need to you know, have the students understanding that will be posted at this time every day. Um, so there's no worries about, you know, have they missed it or, or what the story is. So creating a really clear routine for them. And then creating engaging content. So I know for my school, we've been um, setting a slide deck, which is like PowerPoint um, for our students, for our students uh, every day with the schedule similar to what you might do in class. Um, if you've got the sort of schedule for the day, the students know what to expect, uh, really clear expectations there. And again, making it fun and engaging. Sharing videos. Um, I was reading some research recently that surprised me and it actually said that students are more likely to engage with the video and watch a video that's actually got you, their teacher in it, over a nice like polished, put together um, YouTube video. And this was amazing for me because I don't know the amount of time that I've spent on YouTube searching up the perfect video that's going to explain the content that I want um, with, you know, nice transitions and all that. But then actually, after I read that research, I went and asked my students and I said, would you prefer to watch me like explaining this content to you or would you prefer to watch this video? And they all said they prefer to watch me, <laughs> which surprised me because I'm definitely not as good as um, a lot of these YouTube stars. Um, however, it's because they trust their teacher. It's because they um, they know you and they've got that relationship with you. So I do encourage you if you are introducing new content and it's going to be um, asynchronous, so it's not at the same time as the students, um, then think about using uh, tools like Screencastify or Loom to record yourself. It could just be a recording of your screen if you prefer not to have your face in it. But again, the students do actually like to see your, their teachers' faces. And then Edpuzzle, if you haven't tried it before, is a really awesome um, edtech tool which enables you to embed videos and have questions um, put in along the way so that the students watch a part of the video and then the question comes up for them. So they answer the question. So that's also keeping them accountable for actually watching those videos uh, rather than just skipping through it. Uh, you've also got awesome tools in, um, if you're a Microsoft 365 user, the PowerPoint option to be able to record your screen um, and add in the audio is quite cool as well. Uh, here's an idea that was that's also from a friend of mine, um, Emma Pass. I mentioned her earlier. She's been teaching in a hybrid school. So she recommends that she embeds her videos into her slides or into a PowerPoint and then has the questions along the side. Um, ensuring, again, that the students are actually watching the videos to support their learning. Now moving over to synchronous learning. So aim for 100% participation rates. We want all of our students who are in our live virtual lessons or who are in our classroom to be engaged. I can't stand it when I'm teaching at the front of the room and I ask a question, I've got the same five students with their hands up. I don't like that. I want every single student with their hand up. 
And once I discovered using Nearpod and Pear Deck, that fully changed my teaching experience because it meant that I no longer had just the students that always have their hands up answering. I had every single student answering, the shy students, the students that know it all but don't necessarily want to share, the students that um, are a little bit nervous about sharing and because they might not be right. Um, this really did change the way that I teach. So I encourage you to try some of these out. So Nearpod, Pear Deck and Smart Learning Suite are ones that I recommend, but there's, I'm sure there's more. If you've got further ideas, then you'll have an opportunity now to actually um, share that because what we're going to be doing is actually trying Nearpod so that instead of me explaining what it, explaining what it is, you can experience it. So interactive part now, what I'm going to ask you to do is to go to a new browser or a new tab and, and type in join.nearpod.com. You don't need to sign in or anything because I'm just going to be giving you a, a code. So the code is here. So join.nearpod.com. And then I'm projecting the code now. It's Q-O-T-R-F. And as you can see as well, we've got the option once we're in Nearpod to be able to share this to our Google Classroom or our Microsoft team. Um, so it's a great, it's a great, easy way to be able to sync those in. Now you're able to join after um, I've started the session as well here. So can I ask someone handy, maybe um, James, do you mind popping the code into our, our chat there as well? So um, I can get going and we can have people still joining in afterwards. Thanks, Graham. Okay, let's see if we've got some in. Yep, we've got 12 of you in. And again, feel free to um, join afterwards. So let me just show you one more time. It's join.nearpod.com. Graham, do you mind popping that in? Or, or James as well. Okay, and let's get started. 19 of you now, perfect. So as you can see, I'm now presenting my screen onto your screens, or you can see the same screen I can see um, if you're in that student view tab. So the first question I've got for you is which online platform does your school use? And I'm going to show your names now, but I've got the option to turn off your names if I wanted to as well. So if you just go ahead on your student view and put in the answer. So we've got a mix between Microsoft schools um, and one Google school. Oh, yeah, we've got a nice mix there. And it does look like everyone has Microsoft or Google, we don't have any without, so that's awesome. Okay, oh, here we go, we've got one without. Great, thanks for sharing. So as the teacher, I can then share that with the students as well. So by sharing my screen there, um, the students are able to see an overview of, of whatever question I've just asked there. Moving along, the next one is the collaboration board. Uh, this is probably my favorite part of Nearpod um, because it's really good for brainstorming with the students and they can all, um, you know, add in as we go along. So the question for you is, how has your school been supporting stu students during COVID? You don't need to write a massive um, amount. You can just um, share a couple of ideas. So cool. We've got teaching through Teams, device and dongle access. So what I can do as a teacher is actually hide the names. So if I feel like I, the students might hold back a little bit because they know who is who, then I'll just click on hide there. And so uh, now you can't see the names, um, which I quite like doing because it means that as a teacher, I can go in and, and have a look and see who, who if anyone was being silly and they know that they're, they're going to be held accountable. Um, but also it does create that um, you know, ability for students to not be worried about what they're sharing. And then you can see as well that you can go ahead and like different ideas that you're seeing pop up. So if you are seeing an idea that you, that you do as well or that you think is a great idea, then you can hit the heart button and, um, and then you can like those. So sometimes what I'll do here when I'm using Nearpod um, is let's say it's a literacy lesson. At the beginning of the lesson, I will um, you know, introduce what we're going to be talking about, what we're going to be writing about, sorry. And then I'll have the students come up and write um, on, their, on their devices. They will write their idea for a sentence structure, a uh, first sentence starter, sorry. 
And then um, I'll take those ideas, we'll say, okay, go ahead and like the ones that you think are the best, the students go and like them. And then I'll use the ones that have got the highest amount of likes and then turn that into my shared write. So it's a nice way to be able to have every single person um, involved in the shared write rather than just those same children that have their, their hands up. Some really nice um, ideas coming through, lovely. Someone's even put in a picture there, very nice. Now, when you're using um, this as well, you do have the option to be able to decide whether you as the teacher want to approve the posts before they come up or if you just want to let them come up. So it really depends if you've got a class that you think you can trust to just let them pop up, then you can do that. If you've got a class that you think actually there will be some people will do some silly things here, then you can just approve or deny. OK, the next one we'll go on to now is drawing. So you've got a minute for this activity and what you're going to be drawing is an emoji of your feelings towards using technology for teaching. Now, this obviously is a little bit easier if you're using a touch screen or if you've got a tablet, um, but have a go. I'm guessing most of you aren't on a touch screen or tablet, but um, let's see what your, your drawings come up like. Got an interesting one there so far. Your names are off as well, so don't feel don't feel any fear about your drawings being exposed or who you are being exposed. Got some hearts and smileys. Someone in my last session figured out that they could also add in an image to this. So if you don't want to draw, you could find an image online. I love this one, such detail. <laughs> You've got 20 seconds left if you want to keep adding in. Maybe I think a lot of these could do with some hair. <laughs> Ten seconds left. Oh, wow, look at that one. Impressive. So then as a teacher, once the time's up, I can then go ahead and choose um, some that I want to share with the rest of the class. So, for example, uh, this one I might want to share with everyone. So I've just clicked on share there, so that's going to pop up uh, for you on your screen. You can also do this on phones as well. Um, so I've, I've certainly used this when some of my students don't have access um, at home to a computer. I've had them using their, their phone too. Some really nice um, images there. A pineapple. <laughs> Love it. Okay. All right. Moving on. And our last uh, question here. This time I'll show you what it's like if as a teacher I'm going to approve the post that I put on. So I'll click on yes, I do want to approve. So the last question for you, what are your favorite online education applications? Um, so, you know, for example, I've talked about Jamboard, I've talked about Nearpod. What other ones are you using with your school that you like? Now, they don't have to be sort of just broad blended learning ones. They could be more specific, um, more specific ones to a subject. Um, for example, yeah, you've got some great ones there coming through already. So many great ones. So you can see that you might need to wait for a little bit until I approve them. So this is just what happens if as a, um, a teacher, I want to approve them first so that I know that they're okay before the rest of the class sees them. So if you want to then go ahead and click like on any that you've tried before or any that you agree with as well, might be this might be a good opportunity for you to be learning. I'll show names now. Um, some... Uh, learning about some new applications that you might want to try. Oh, Soundtrap's good. Yeah, Flipgrid. Yeah, some really nice ideas there. Awesome. Okay, and we're going to head back to the slides now. Hopefully, if you hadn't tried Nearpod before, that was a, um, a little bit of a sneak uh, peek into what it can do, um, but really great for get, gaining that um, um, really high participation rates from your students. And um, to be honest, I don't think that I could have taught through Google Meet so well if I didn't have Nearpod. I used it in almost every single lesson. All right. Now, another tip um, from Emma Pass is to think about having movement breaks, especially if we're, this is where thinking about teaching asynchronous, sorry, teaching synchronously here. So just like we are sitting here together, I don't know if some of you have been sitting since 8 a.m. this morning doing work. 
Um, it's nice to be able to encourage the students to do some movement breaks. So maybe using some emojis, having the students copy that, um, but also the breathing. Um, and another one that I like to do with my students is just to play a couple of games together. So you may have heard me talk about this before because I it's the most fun game that I've ever played with my students um, synchronously. But I, I had a little scavenger hunt. So I'll say to the students, OK, um, right, the first person that can bring me this object will get a point. And so, for example, it might be the first person to bring me an item out of the fridge. And so then they'll all run through the house. They'll all go looking for this for the fridge and find the item and come back and, and hold it up. And then I'll be allocating the points. Um, and I also do that with like first person to bring an animal. And so we get the pets involved. We get the one student suggested first person to bring a bald head. That was a weird one. Um, but there's always a, a lot of fun that you can have with with those. So don't just think about teaching synchronously it has to be sitting down, you know, teacher giving the students a lecture. It doesn't have to be like that. It can be very interactive and very fun. Get the students moving. Um, another consideration to think about is actually providing opportunities for discussion. So I know uh, when I first started doing my Google Meets with my students, but same idea if I was using Microsoft Teams. Um, I just felt like I'm what I was missing was that time where I'd say to my students, okay, now discuss with your partner. In class, we had talk partners, so I'd always be getting them to go and discuss. Or I'd say, okay, as a as a table group, um, come up with an idea together or, or talk about that together or do a pair, square, share. Um, but we couldn't do that in um, the virtual meeting. So I looked into ways around that and tried out um, actually having some breakout rooms. And I know that other teachers have tried this as well. So in Teams, this would look like having a, uh, channels and the channels are your individual breakout rooms because in each channel you can have a separate discussion, a separate video call. And if you haven't done it before, you can bounce between the channels really easily. So as the teacher, you'd go in and you'd come into each channel um, and sort of pop into the discussion and see what's going on there. So we'd always start off with one um, whole class group together and then say, OK, now we're going to break out to your groups, talk about it there, and then we'll come back and you can present or you can discuss. Uh, in Google Meet, that looks more like this. So I just break up the um, different Google Meet links into the different rooms. Um, and then as a teacher, I actually went in and re started recording in all the rooms first, just so that I've got that sort of um, record and the students know that every room is being recorded as well. And then um, if you do have learning support assistants or TAs, that's a great place for them to be able to um, facilitate discussion in a smaller group. Um, you might base these groups on ability. You might base them on interest. There's a whole range of ways that you could do it. Um, but certainly by involving the, the teacher's aides, that's a, a great idea. Um, and then you can just be bouncing yeah, as a teacher in between and, and checking that the discussion is all on task. Uh, next up for synchronous learning is thinking about gamification. So how can we make um, the learning so fun that the students want to join every time? And I was really lucky that um, for my class, I um, got 95 to 100% um, of our students joining. And uh, I think that was largely because I used things like quizzes and Kahoot. And so they were excited and uh, wanted to come to all of the lessons. And I had one student that actually cried because she had a doctor's appointment at the same time as, um, as one of our live Google Meets. So we want to make this fun for the students. And it's just the same thing in class because you can use quizzes, you can use Kahoot in class. Uh, if you haven't tried either of these before, they are um, sort of great for interactive um, game-like quizzes. We're actually going to try one at the end of our session as well. Okay, and then thinking about building class and school community. So I know some of you have already been doing this, online assemblies. Um, these are a lot of fun. You might even want to consider recording some of your assemblies uh, to share with the students in case, in the case that uh, we still have some of our learners who are at home even come September. Uh, theme days, we've had so many theme days and it's been great to be sharing pictures and um, seeing the different uh, fun things that the students are doing at home. Book weeks still can happen even if it's remotely. Competitions, and um, again, so many great opportunities there. Just think about the competitions that you do in school. How can you apply that to an online environment? I bet it's not too much of a change. Virtual lunchrooms is another one that I've been thinking about. 
Um, I don't know if you if you guys have done the same, but when it's raining, like right now for me, and the students are all inside having their lunch um, in the classroom, I often just put on a you know a video or something for them to watch. But could we just have a Google Meet on, and then any of the students that are at home can be eating their lunch as well while they're smiling together and um, you know having that shared time together. And um, you know, I think that. I, I think that that's, there's a great opportunity there, um, even if, you know, there is a, a mixture of in-person and online. Right, moving now on to providing clear expectations. So we need to think about which uh, synchronous, asynchronous and in-person expectations we need to have on the students and we need to clearly communicate with them. So I've got the little Jamboard sign there to remind me that we're now going to head back over to our Jamboard. And this is an opportunity for you to think about what these expectations are that we can have for our students. So it's on the second page there. So we've got our Venn diagram where we've, we're thinking about what we can add in. So things like for synchronous online learning, we've got muting your mics on arrival. But actually, that's quite similar, isn't it, to when you're in person, you would expect perhaps the students to enter the classroom quietly um, in an orderly fashion, for example. Um, being on time to the lessons, we you know, would expect that to happen in person, but also in a synchronous environment when we've got our students who are um, joining our Microsoft Teams meeting or our Google Meet meeting. So over to you, can you think about some expectations to add in there on our second page of the Jamboard? If you haven't used it before, um, the way that you can jump across is just by either um, putting the drop down arrow so you can see the different pieces or you can just um, click, click across. Definitely treat people with respect, that's a good one arrive ready to learn and contribute. Yeah, that's a great one. And that would look different in um, the different sort of sectors. So if it's in person, you expect the students to have their pencil case ready, you expect them to have the right book. But then if it's online, you obviously you expect them to um, have their device charged uh, to, you know, have any resources that they need ready to go. Another great one, ask questions if you don't understand. Yep, nice one. Use the chat feature responsibly. Yeah, really good, really good point there. And obviously that's for synchronous, synchronous learning too. But I guess that could also cross over if you're using um, like Neopod or something like that, but with the students in, um, in person, then again, we do expect them to be using that technology um, responsibly. Set clear rules for participation. Absolutely, another great one there. Um, where would that go? I think that's that would be across, well, probably here, synchronous and in person. Awesome. Now, because of time, I'm going to carry on, but I really like what you're doing here. So if you want to keep adding in there and you can keep this Jamboard for after and use this for how you might want to think about structuring your um, expectations for your students and how you might want to share that with the students come September, because um, come September, you know, we do need to provide really um, clear expectations so that we're all on the same page. Yeah, some really good ones there. Cool. I want to keep looking, but I know I need to move on because of time. <laughs> okay, so one thing that I do with my students is very similar to this. At the beginning of the year, I share a jam board with them and I get the students to put down the different things that they think is going to make the year be successful. And so these are basically like our class Last year it was 4D, we were setting our expectations for how we're going to make sure that everyone is, um, you know, treating each other with respect, everyone is going to help each other learn, encouraging of each other, all those sorts of things. Uh, but this year I've been thinking about how I would adapt that slightly for a more blended approach. So thinking about um, what I would want my students to say when um, we're using, how they can use technology to be respectful of their classmates, um, how they can be safe and secure online and how they can support their, um, their own learning, but also their peers' learning when online. And then once I have my students brainstorm their ideas out, I then um, get them to go ahead and just tick or put a smiley face next to the ones they agree with. 
So again, it's keeping that interaction uh, there, um, but it's it's great because they're taking the ownership over it. And they usually, generally, as a teacher, you can sort of lead them down to say to, to put down what you want them to, to say. I'm sure you've experienced that before as a teacher. You can um, sort of sway it the way that you need um, and and ask point of questions. But I would encourage you to to think about doing that with your students so that they do have that ownership too. And then when we're thinking about providing our expectations for our students. Also think about how we're empowering them to be safe and respectful digital citizens, because by giving them the opportunity to use Teams and to use Classroom, we are enabling them to really develop these digital literacy skills and these skills of, of learning how to, um, you know, be online, to be safe and to be respectful. Uh, one recommendation I'd have is the Be Internet Legends um, by Google. It's an interland um, game and a lot of good content in there. Um, my students love it, but it's also teaching them at the same time. So if you haven't used that, it might be worth checking out. Um, but always keep your discussions that you're having with your class around how we are learning and developing skills, um, even as we're in a math lesson or even as we're in a, a science lesson, no matter what it is, if we're using technology, they're still learning how to be um, a digital citizen. Okay, now moving on to ideas for getting started in September. Now, actually, the ideas I'm going to be showing you can be synchronous, asynchronous, or in person. So it can be a combination. It could be um, if, if for unknown reasons, um, we do need to be teaching synchronously, then you can do it that way, uh, but it can also be in class. All right, so some of the ideas I've got here are about creating an online project to get to know your students. I love doing this at the beginning of every year so that I, I know my students. I find it really fun to see what their likes and their dislikes are, um, who is in their family, if they have pets, what ways they like to learn, what ways they don't like to learn. Um, so by pr providing my students an opportunity to give me all of that information and to be able to share it with their classmates, um, it's always a lot of fun. and. For the last years, I've always been doing it in a digital way because not only am I um, introducing this um, sort of project, I'm also able to understand how well they're able to use the technology and what I need to teach next. So a couple of ideas here. So if you're a Google school, Jamboard, like we've been trying out, is nice for the early years and for infants. Um, I've seen reception students using it with no problem. Um, uh, for primary, Google Slides is a nice one. I've also got my primary school students, my year four students to use Google Sites, so that's another option. But if they're not sort of well trained in it, then maybe that would be more of a secondary one. And then for Microsoft, we've got Flipgrid for the younger students, because um, that's quite an easy one. They get to express and talk about uh, their, you know, about themselves. We've got PowerPoint for primary and we've got Sway for secondary. But again, the two primary and secondary there could potentially be um, mixed and matched. So here's an example of um, students' uh, Google site from last year. So just introducing themselves, putting in images. Um, then they've got these different pages up the top where they can have sections about their hobbies, their favorite ways to learn, writing that they've done. And what I've loved about doing this was that I did it at the beginning of the year, but actually my students have all been adding into it the whole year. And it's turned into this amazing um, sort of online portal for each student where they've been adding in pictures of their favorite tasks. We do topic homework and they've been adding in pictures of their topic homework. Um, and yeah, it's been it's been an amazing project. So um, if, even if you do start a project like this at the beginning of the year, don't think that it's just going to be limited to that one thing. Uh, another example of uh, Jamboard, so younger students able to draw, add in pictures, all these different things to be able to share um, about themselves. And now what I um, have been thinking about recently is how we can actually get the students to learn about each other. So it's not just the teacher, um, you know, finding out about the students, but the students actually getting to know each other and building that sense of class community. So by keeping them accountable, um, ensuring that they go in and they check out each other's work, we can turn that into a quiz. And again, this was an, an idea from Emma Pass. Um, so we can turn this into a live virtual quiz or it could be something we do in class by using uh, Kahoot or Quizzes or Quizlet. So we're actually going to be trying Kahoot now. I have four minutes left. So we're gonna quickly jump into our Kahoot um, and then we'll 
go over and, and have a look at this, the Jamboard. Okay, four minutes. You're going to have to be quick. <laughs> this time, um, you're going to open up a new tab or use your phone and you're going to head over to kahoot.it or www.kahoot.it. And you've got the code to put in there. I'm not surprised, the grains first. <laughs> so either, um, if you want to try your phone, sometimes it's easier because then you can um, you can see on the screen I'm projecting the questions and the answers, and then on your phone you're going to be able to tap the colour that is the same as the correct answer. Um, otherwise, you can just switch between watching my screen and then the tab that you've got your um, own view on. So you won't be able to see the answers in your own tab. You'll need to switch between. That's just a heads up that I always need to give my students at the beginning. Obviously, if you're doing this in class, then on your interactive whiteboard at the front, you've got this and then they've got the device in front of them ready to answer. If you don't know what I'm talking about, it'll make sense soon. Okay, we're going to get started. Off we go. Attention. True or false? It's good for students to enter live lessons with their microphones muted. We've got five seconds left. Okay, amazing. It is good to have the mentor with their microphones muted just because it means that um, you'll be able to explain to them the expectations at the beginning. And this is also about speed. So M was very fast. Let's move on. Nearpod only works for key stage three. True or false? Five seconds. Okay, so that's false. So you can use Nearpod um, in any stage and it will work effectively. Scoreboard, M is still in the lead, but Karen has stepped up. It's okay for students to use their personal Gmail account to access live lessons. So we're talking about Microsoft Teams or Google Classroom. Five seconds left. Okay, we've got a bit of a mix here. Um, I would say not okay because we only want our students to be entering using the school account so that we can monitor that and we have the accountability over that for GDPR purposes. And we know exactly who they are as well, if they're entering in their school accounts. Okay, James is coming up. We've got Graham coming up. Let's see who's next. The government is funding schools to get G Suite or Microsoft Teams set up. Five seconds, quick one. Awesome. So I mentioned earlier that the government is funding that. Um, so let people know if they don't already. Not much change there. Microsoft Teams and Google Classroom are only good for remote learning. Pass around. Okay, amazing. I'm glad everyone here knows that. Um, but it has been a question that I've been asked a lot lately, actually. Um, people have said, oh, why, why do we need it anymore if, if school's going back in September? <laughs> I'm trying to explain, well, I was using it for seven years before that. Um, so, yeah, it's great that everyone is aware of that. HP stands for? This is something that hopefully you all know, um, but I have to admit, I did have to double check. Okay, well done everyone, the 14 of you that got that one correct. Awesome, not much change there. Almost done. What percentage of UK children aged 5 to 16 were reported to not have access to a device in early 2020? Got a bit longer here. Back all our answers are in. Maybe too long. Okay, ooh, bit of a mix there. So 34%, that might surprise some of you. Um, surprise me. Okay, we've got AB in the lead now. 
Which online software do you think is currently most common in UK schools? So majority of you got that one right at the moment, Microsoft 365, and James is in the lead. I feel like you, you had a little, you know, of course you knew that one. Synchronous learning is when teaching and learning takes place at the same time and in the same space. True or false? So we're talking about synchronous here, and yep, that's, that's true. So it is when it's taking place in like a Microsoft Teams environment or a Google environment or an in-person. We have James in the lead. Second last question. Kahoot only works if students have access to a phone and laptop. Okay, amazing. We've got the majority of you went for false, which is true. You can just have a device. And last question. We are called Just Us because. Had a bit more time on this one. Okay, it's a combination of our founder's last names. So let's have a look at our podium. So we have M in third place. Well done, whoever M is. Rena in second place. Well done. You crept up there. And who's going to be first? James. <laughs> I feel like that's cheating, James. But well done. I did not cheat. And Maria in, um, our, as our runners up. Okay. Let's head out of there now. And I'll just jump back over to the slide deck. So hopefully you could see um, there that, you know, there is a lot of fun that can be had by using some of these online games. And now I know I've run over by a couple of minutes, but let's just jump over to our Nearpod, if, I'm sorry, to our Jamboard. If you do need to jump off, then thank you so much for joining. Um, but let's just go and have a quick look and see if anyone has any questions about, um, oh, about any devices. If you want to as well, you can also, what we might say now is, um, if you do need to jump off, then thank you very much. But if you want to stay on, then feel free to unmute and ask any of your questions for Alex. Or Alex, did you want to jump in there? Yeah, yeah, guys, sorry, I, I need to jump off as well. Um, but Rachel, would you be able to share my my um, email address with the guys in the call? Um, yeah, and there's lots to think about. That was really, really interesting. Um, but yeah, devices to suit each each way of teaching and whether that is you know something that's portable that you know that students can be mobile whether that's google you know whether it's a microsoft platform you know is it something that has to be really robust because of the age of your students um is a touch screen important do you need a camera there's so many things to think about and uh, like i said at the start of the, the, the call it's, it's definitely not a one-stop shop um, so yeah, we work really closely with Just Cost and Just Cost being one of our partners because they've got a specific focus on education and it's, uh, it's much less about, you know, this here's, here's, here's a piece of laptop, here's a laptop and it'll sit in the corner and go and write an essay on it. It's much more to do with how can we integrate this as part of the, part of the lesson and allowing you to sort of t tick the boxes that you need to in terms of your curriculum. But yes, if you could just get my, my, share my, my details with the guys, Rachel, and, um, I will get back to you each and every one of you. Thank you so much. And obviously Thanks, none, of these, none of the things that we've talked about would be possible without having the devices in front of the students. So um, thank you, Alex, for joining. And uh, James, are you helping me get that email address or should I grab it now? Up to Alex, you. I, you beat me by typing it into the chat. Oh, oh yeah, I'll, I'll pop it in the chat. Okay, guys. <laughs> right, right. right. Thanks, guys. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone, so much for joining. And thank I hope you. you have... Oh, sorry, James. No, I said thank you very much, everybody, for colleagues, for sharing your time with us. Hope it was fun. Hope you learned something. Hope you take something away. Please come back to us, reach out to us, ask if there's anything you want to delve into a bit deeper.